the Voice of America was established in 1942 and uh, more or less as a propaganda arm of the American government, trying to tell all the good stories about what happened. And it's, it's taxpayer funded and has become a, a part of that uh, overseen by the U.S. Agency for Global Media. Now, in recent decades, though, the VOA has become not only a multimedia company, but much more... I would say independent in its reporting and its journalism and not a mouthpiece for the U.S. government anymore. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome Steve Herman, the Voice of America VOA, White House Bureau Chief, a friend of mine for decades now, and, and um, one of the best, uh, most respected journalists out there. Steve, welcome to the show. It's so great to uh, see you again. Great to see you again, Glenn. And uh, Neil, I, I have a message for you from your bank, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, before we start, Steve, congratulations for being the best dressed guest we have ever had on the show. Had, we've right? ever had, yeah. Easily. Totally. Easily. They, they told me there'd be video, so. <laughs> <laughs> and Steve, I have, to, I have to say one more thing, and that is a, a sincere thank you for coming on because I know what a week you have had and for you to be taking part of what is your Friday night uh, after Inauguration Day uh, to, to be with us. I, I well, really it's America. We can't go out because of COVID. <laughs> well, there you go. So well, Steve, yeah, nothing better to do, right? <laughs> as a journalist myself, Steve, I'm just curious. What has your week been like in terms of hours and workload? I mean, it must have been nonstop. Uh, there were a couple of nights there when I had about uh, uh, three hours uh, sleep. I actually went into Washington, D.C. and stayed in a hotel for a couple of nights uh, because of the green zones and the red zones and the, the gauntlet to uh, get to the White House uh, for a couple of days in a row uh, was uh, quite an adventure reminiscent of, of Baghdad. So yeah. uh, it, yeah. it's, it, it's, I, I was very, very happy to get a full night's sleep last night for the first time <laughs> in a long time. Steve, and, and those of you listening and watching on Facebook Live, if you have any questions for Steve about covering the White House for the past four years, please throw them in the chat for us. But Steve, take us, uh, because it's so fresh, you were you were the pool reporter following the ex-president. You were at and Andrews Air Force Base at his departure, and then you flew down to Florida for his arrival in Florida. Tell us about that event, covering the going and then arrival into Florida of uh, the former president. Number right. 35. He was still a, a president at that point, uh, Glenn. Uh, the president took Marine One for the very last time out to Joint Base Andrews, about a 12-minute helicopter ride from the White House uh, just outside D.C. and Maryland. And I was part of the uh, press pool uh, waiting there. Um, there were about 200 invited guests that showed up. It was very reminiscent of the MAGA rallies we uh, used to intend with the blaring uh, 70s uh, rock uh, track uh, uh, on these huge speakers. And the president came off of Marine One with uh, Melania uh, Trump. And uh, he gave one of the shortest speeches ever. He was very subdued. It only lasted about nine minutes. Uh, the real take away line from all of that before he boarded Air Force One was, I'll be back in some form. <laughs> so a lot of speculation about what that means. Wax, then, wax figure, perhaps, or something. Who knows, right? I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, did, I, I, I can say that uh, after our arrival uh, in uh, Florida, and I'm happy to talk about the Air Force One flight down, but after our arrival, um, I, I can say that I was the person, the reporter, who a attempted to ask him the very last question of his presidency. Jim Acosta from CNN, shout out, had a question about uh, uh, whether he had any regrets about January 6th. And then I asked him uh, about these reports that he's planning to form what, be what would be called the Patriot Party. And uh, he turned, looked at us and waved and said thank you and, and climbed into the armored vehicle and uh, rode down Southern Boulevard in um, Palm Beach. Uh, there were hundreds of people lined on the streets, most of them cheering him, some with uh, Trump 2024 signs. Uh, there were a few Biden supporters out there as well. They had some police around them guarding them because that's a very pro-Trump uh, neighborhood apparently. Mm. The motorcade slowed down to a crawl and uh, Trump took it all in in the waning moments of his presidency, waved uh, to, to the crowd. Uh, I was in pool van three, 
And uh, when they realized uh, they were looking at the media near the back of the motorcade, uh, we were extended the courtesy of the middle finger uh, numerous times uh, by uh, by some in the crowd. And uh, mm -hmm. then the, um, uh, the the bulk of the motorcade uh, pulled into Mar-a-Lago. The, mm -hmm. the pool vans did not enter. And uh, we sat in a nearby parking lot uh, until the the stroke of noon, even though uh, Joe Biden had taken the oath of office a little bit early, but uh, we were there until the very end of the uh, Trump presidency. So, Steve, did I hear that right? You were on Air Force One, is that correct? On the flight yes. down. What What was that like? What was the mood on the plane like with the right. Trump family? I've flown on the on the plane dozens and dozens of times uh, with uh, uh, Trump during his presidency. And sometimes he'll come back, talk to us on the record, off the record. He did not. Uh, there was a lot of family on the plane that day. Uh, the most unusual aspect of that flight was when we were um, uh, coming in to land at Palm Beach International Airport, uh, the uh, pilots did a low-altitude flyby of Mar-a-Lago. Hmm. Uh, which was an interesting angle. I put out some uh, a, a photo of that on uh, on Twitter, of course, and it was a very subdued uh, atmosphere. And I, I think also uh, for the the media as well, we realized this was the very end of an era. We were witnessing uh, a part of uh, history. Uh, the other notable takeaway from that uh, was uh, the the final meal of the Trump presidency on Air Force One was... Um, <laughs> I, I saw you you posted the menu yeah, on your Facebook other page. Other style steak and eggs and grits. <laughs> cheesy grits, um, nonetheless. <laughs> cheesy grits, yeah, you remember very well. And uh, we had a, uh, a steward uh, did come back to the press cabin with a special basket of the Donald Trump autographed M&Ms and... Uh, matchbooks and that was a surprise to me because uh i thought the matchbooks went out with the reagan era nancy <laughs> reagan had uh, banned the uh, the complimentary packs of cigarettes with cigarette smoking on air force one um although i think on that flight uh, down to florida there were probably a few on the plane that did want to have a cigarette Steve, this is like a, a 1980s wedding. You know, you get a book of matches with the couple's name on it, maybe a cocktail stir, a napkin. Right. Uh, unbelievable, right, that uh, after so much time, this is what you're getting. Um, Steve, put into perspective, if, if you can, what it was like for the four years. I mean, I've been following you on Facebook and, and seeing the, the trials and travails. Trump has more than once gone after you directly uh, during Q&A sessions and really putting the full weight of pressure, not only on you, but many of your colleagues at VA. Um, what was are you in therapy or going to be in therapy I mean what what was that experience like no, no uh, when, I, when I, I when I signed up for this uh, I signed up specifically knowing that this was going to be a, a, a very unusual and unprecedented presidency it was not going to be boring uh, yeah. it, but early on it, it became uh, clear uh, that uh, President Trump was going to demonize the media, and uh, I actually, one of the early stories that I did, along with uh, my colleague Jeff Selden on the National Security Beat, uh, was shortly after uh, uh, Trump used this phrase, uh, enemies of the people, mm -hmm. and uh, we pointed out that this was not some sort of innocuous language, whether uh, Trump yeah. knew its background or not, but uh, linking it to uh, the, 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 the Soviet Union of uh, Stalin, uh, it was it was very ominous and uh, and at rallies we always have a secret service agent with us not necessarily to protect us but uh, to make sure that nobody infiltrates the little bubble uh, that we're traveling in uh, but uh, there were times where I thought maybe the secret service agent was going to have to intervene and of course uh, near the uh, the end of the uh, Trump presidency many many organizations were hiring security guards to accompany them uh, at the at the MAGA rallies and also in Washington D.C. So that was a bit unusual. I've uh, spent 26 years in Asia uh, covering uh, uh, coups and uh, riots and um, contested elections and and all sorts of things. So I had had a bit of a background um, for. Um, 
you know, being in so-called fragile democracies and in, in, in more autocratic countries, but to experience this in 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 your own country uh, as a reporter uh, was was definitely something I had never experienced in my career previous to wow. that. Wow. On on that point, Steve, where were you when the insurrection around Capitol Hill happened? Was you covering the event where President Trump spoke with his family, or did you have a day off that day? I was. I had a day off. I was in Miami, Florida, actually, <laughs> and I uh, was trying to sit out on the balcony of my hotel, catch a little sun, because I was flying back that evening, and uh, realized, uh oh, something really appears amiss at the Capitol, then came inside to sort of watch it on uh, TV. And, um, and, and so I, I did arrive back in, in Washington uh, uh, that evening. Any, any, what was your initial thoughts having covered the presidency for so long? Shock, surprise, expectancy? How did well, you feel? At, when that was going on, we really didn't realize how bad it was, right? Uh, we, we knew that there had been a, an incursion in the Capitol and, and people were, were, were obviously misbehaving, but the initial video coming out did not reflect the severity of the situation. And we had no idea that uh, the, the mob was literally just minutes or less from, uh, from being able to, uh, to get to some of the lawmakers and, and the vice president and, and possibly could have in, uh, you know, intercepted uh, those physical electoral uh, votes that were, were sitting in the uh, uh, mahogany box. So it, w it wasn't until later that it really sank in, as, as it was the case with, with everybody else, just uh, how scary of a situation that yeah. was. Yeah. Steve, you, you mentioned you spent uh, more than two decades in Asia. I know you, you, you and I first met in Tokyo back in the early right. 90s, but you lived in Bangkok. You've lived a lot of places and covered stories all over uh, this region. Uh, over the past four years, so much has been made about the fake news media, uh, the often repeated phrase by uh, the Trump uh, White House and administration and others. Do you sense that there is long-term damage to... Uh, the brand of journalism, both uh, in the U.S. and overseas, as a result of that constant uh, haranguing, and of course, it's been picked up, um, you know, in the Philippines and other, and, and Venezuela, other countries around the world. Now, the the leaders there have picked up that same kind of language. I, I think in a lot of countries, uh, journalists have been in in jeopardy for a long, long time. Uh, the Philippines, uh, especially in Asia, uh, it, it seems not a month goes by where some radio uh, journalist or a talk show host isn't uh, uh, shot at it or, or, or assassinated. Um, mm -hmm. So th this is this is nothing new. To, you know, the kill the messenger, of course, goes back to uh, to ancient times. Uh, it's unfortunate. Um, it does make our job a lot harder. I think what has changed in recent years here in the United States is we went from an era where most of the uh, mainstream journalism was, was middle of the road. We had something called the Fairness Doctrine regulating right. broadcasting in this country for a long, long time. And then with AM talk radio, um, it started to veer off in, into partisanship. There was left-wing talk radio for a while, too. There was a network called Air America. It just didn't uh, uh, take off the way that uh, some of the conservative talk show hosts did over the decades. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, on uh, television as well, with the rise of 24-7 cable uh, news, uh, what broad, what those uh, uh, entities found out is if you took a particular political stance, you could um, uh, capture a lot more audience. Just to be sort of middle of the road uh, was boring. And uh, then there's what's called confirmation bias. People just wanted to tune in and and hear their views reaffirmed and uh and and so look these are commercial broadcast outlets their their main goal is is to make money i've been very very fortunate most of my career to work for public a nonprofit, or government funded broadcasting where uh, my bosses didn't have to worry about ratings and, and the bottom line so um, it's very different. But getting back to the first part of your question, Glenn, uh, 
you know, hearing this phrase fake news, I think at the White House, it was probably most difficult for the Fox News reporters uh, to, because they're sitting in the room with, with everybody else. And, 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 and the media is not monolithic in the United States. It does uh, go from quite liberal media to very conservative media. And of course, there's now a big debate uh, with um, uh, the social media platforms as to where does free sp speech end and uh, censorship yeah. begin uh, because of the, the question of whether something that you are saying is inciting violence. Mm. But it's an interesting point, Steve, you make about confirmation bias because international viewers like ourselves in Singapore, I think myself, uh, people I know, increasingly were switching away, to be frank, from the American cable news networks and watching international news networks such as ABC in Australia or BBC in the UK because of that confirmation bias. You know, to pick a couple of examples, CNN on one side, Fox News on the other, you could sometimes feel like you were watching, they were covering two entirely different events right. when they're supposed to be talking about the same thing. Now, I know you make the point that they have a bottom line, they're pandering somewhat to a certain established audience, but can that also be counterproductive where if that continues indefinitely, Will the more middle-of-the-road viewers switch elsewhere, switch to watch yourselves, switch to watch BBC, ABC? Could that right. happen? Well, Neil, first of all, you're very fortunate overseas that you have this uh, cornucopia of choice. But for a lot of Americans uh, with their uh, basic cable package, uh, they don't have that choice. There is um, CNN or Fox or MSNBC, uh, so they're probably going to gravitate to whatever they feel most comfortable with. The other uh, uh, big question is whether there really is this middle of the road hmm. uh, anymore. I can tell you, I came back to the United States in 2016 after 26 years in Asia, and the biggest culture shock for me was finding this country so polarized politically that uh, there there wasn't a middle of the road, and 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 yeah. to try to be, you know, express conservative views on particular issues, maybe about fiscal responsibility and liberal views on, on social values, you, you had to check the boxes with people. You know, you were all this way or, or that way. And if you weren't on whatever side that they were on, then you risked uh, being uh, socially ostracized to some point. And, of course, people could find uh, comfort uh, also for their for their biases, uh, uh, the attitudes by by getting with with like minded people on social media as well. So as, as someone who, you know, really had studied political science for 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 many decades, was a man and as a as a journalist and always looking for two sides of the story. It was shocking to come back to that sort of attitude in the United States with with most of the yeah. people seeming to be either on the left or right and even within one's own family finding this severe polarization. Yeah. I, I guess they're going to do a study yeah. of twins and they'll find the same thing, that there may be one twin who voted for Trump and one twin who voted for Biden. Right. With uh, Steve Herman, of course, the VOA White House Bureau Chief. Steve, we just have a, a couple of minutes left, uh, but I wanted to ask you going forward now, uh, new administration, new White House, new White House uh, communications team. Jen Psaki is, gonna, is the new press secretary. She's already had her first uh, couple of White House briefings and is guaranteed to hold them every day, which is a departure from what uh, the previous administration did. What are your hopes or or what do you think will happen with the relationship between the media and the White House, even conservative media or or liberal, going forward? It's probably going to get a lot less attention on a day-to-day -day basis. Right now, the cable networks are covering these briefings in their entirety. That will probably stop in a couple of weeks because the level of drama just isn't going to to, to mm. be there anymore and and for us for those of us who cover the white house on a day-to-day -day -day basis that's that's fine it was a bit uncomfortable having that spotlight on you where you know these these briefings would go on for for more than an hour
every reporter in the room back in the uh, the Obama days would uh, uh, be able to get their questions in. There were they were you know focusing a lot of the time on on policy points, trying to clarify things. It wasn't that everybody was trying to 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 throw out a gotcha question or that the press secretary was also trying to score uh, political points of uh, you know for for the clips on on the TV newscasts later on. So. I find that to be very refreshing, and if people think that the the briefings are are, are boring and don't want to watch them in their entirety anymore, <laughs> that, that is going to be a sense of normalcy, I think. <laughs> well, that's interesting because it ties in with a comment from one of our listeners' viewers, L.L. Tan, has said, I like the, wa- the blasé way Steve said, oh, he took Air Force One dozens and dozens of times. <laughs> that's detachment in journalism for you. <laughs> so on that point, as you have taken Air Force One so many times and you've covered, let's say, a, a reasonably sort of polarizing era to be uh, diplomatic of the last four years, how do you feel now going forward? Do you feel refreshed? Do you feel energized that it's going to be a more normal, inverted commas, boring era? How do you feel about uh, covering the next four years? Well, I think I'm still sort of depressurizing after the past weeks, months, and years. And... Um, I don't know. Um, I, I think it's going to be refreshing to be able to drill down on partic- particular issues. We were always in sort of crisis mode with the Trump presidency. You couldn't plan your day and say, yeah. "Okay, the the, the, the talking points today are going to be about the economy." So I'm going to I'll have a story for you at 5 p.m. today about the new economic policy because mm. Trump would come out say something and blow up his own messaging and 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 whatever he said became the huge story and you had to focus on that there's going to be a lot more discipline uh with this Biden White House that's that's absolutely certain so we'll be able to sort of plan out and and I think we'll write be writing better stories more qualitative stories uh uh because of that but you know there there's some perception that oh there's just going to be this long honeymoon between uh the white house press corps and and the biden administration not at all at all uh, the uh, the obama administration uh had a very contentious relationship maybe not to the degree of the trump presidency uh with the white house press corps uh and i i think everybody's on their best behavior right now especially after the past four years but uh, look reporters uh regardless of what may be their personal political views are dogged they want to get a good story they want to drill down they are going to be looking to find the inconsistencies in any messaging coming out of any administration steve herman voice of america white house bureau chief thanks so much for being with us today really appreciate it great to see you again thanks pleasure good to see you glenn take care